Brothers and sisters, once again, we're here with one of my favorite interviews, I must say. Um, brother who um, brings a lot of understanding and, and wisdom to a lot of different topics. And today we're going to discuss a topic that's a little bit off from what we usually discuss. Um, the topic being um, mental illness, anxiety, I guess that goes into depression and a mm -hmm. bunch of other things. Um, very interesting. I'm trying to find a post here that something that you wrote on social media on November 23rd, okay, which was on Friday. I got it here at 4.47 p.m. You wrote, since age 16 till this day, I suffer from anxiety attacks with occasional trips to the hospital. I'm sharing this openly because someone is inspired by my fierce courage and bravery yet doesn't ever see me at my weakest moments. We all have an Achilles heel in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Your ability to fight, it is what truly defines you. Someone will see this and become inspired, and if it's just one person, it's well worth it. So, this is something very, um, it's personal, but it's also something that um, I'm surprised that you share because people wouldn't share, you know, something of this magnitude, anxiety attacks, depression, whatever bouts of, of um, these type of um, sicknesses or illnesses they might be going through. But also in the black community is not something that is um, mental illness and, and um, problems of this sort. It's not really something that's discussed. That's right. So what made you come before we start, what is anxiety and, and what are some of the symptoms that you've um, had with these attacks or these bouts of anxiety? Well, I, I would say um, the, the textbook definition of anxiety is uh, any fear that presents itself um, or manifests physically in the human body or in the human mind. Um, anxiety um, essentially is the thought, uh, the feeling of um, being in an environment that one cannot control. And thus, when you realize that you can't control your environment and you can't control the people who are in those environments, um, the body usually has two modalities through which it, it will express itself from that point on. And that's fight or flight. Um, depending upon your personality, you may choose to fight. And uh, Others may choose to flight or run. Um, but this is the body's defense mechanism. Even running is a defense mechanism. You know, um, I, I would want to even draw from the great book of the Proverbs that says a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living, there's hope. You know, so a lot of people um, in our community, black people on the whole, shy from the issue of expressing um, their experiences with anxiety, their bouts with anxiety, simply because as black men living in the diaspora in America or in the Caribbean or even in the UK, we are taught that fear is weakness. Showing fear is weakness. Mm -hmm. You know, we're also taught that, you know, worrying about things make you look soft and weak. So, you know, we fall into this whole machismo BS which is, that's what it is essentially, and we kind of negate something that's very human. It's a human emotion um, to be worried about something that you can't control. It's very human. Doesn't mean that you're weak, doesn't mean that you're not strong, but it means that you're human. It's also human to feel fear. You know, when you touch that stove and you realize it's hot, the next time you go to touch that stove, you're gonna consider, you're gonna think because now a seed was planted based on that experience. Fear is actually healthy. It's healthy to feel fear. The person who doesn't feel fear will visit the grave real soon. There's a lot of people that are not with us who may be six feet deep or may be incarcerated behind bars because they chose not to express fear or they chose not to respect fear. And that's the way I want to word it. You know, right. 
fear is something that you must respect, especially if you want to live. Right. You know, forget all the BS that, you know, I can't be tough if I show weakness. Right. Well, if you think fear is weakness, then there's a problem with you to begin with. Because again, fear is a healthy thing. So when we talk about anxiety, but in particular anxiety as it presents itself in the uh, African-American community, so to speak, or in the diaspora, um, it's something that is traumatically affecting generations of our people. And it goes um, unaddressed, swept under the rug. And, you know, people feel virtually um, embarrassed to express it. I realized um, this week um, after having had an attack, an anxiety attack that I haven't had in years, that there must be somebody going through this. So I said to myself, man, I've been battling this thing for years. Um, I haven't conquered it, but there's somebody going through it. And somebody that's going through it may look up to me. They may look and see that, yo, that brother Zion, you know, he's strong, he's fierce, he's courageous, he's bold. He's a lion, so to speak. But you don't follow me 24 seven. Mm. Everything you know about me are, come from my, my highlights, so to speak, you know, my, my high times. So you haven't seen me at my lowest points. Transparency is very important in when you position yourself in an, as a leader in a community, as a leader in action or as, as a leader in speech, but nonetheless as a leader, you have to be transparent. We should never be so great insidiously to ourselves in our mind that we can't open up and be ourselves in front of people and allow them to see us for who we are uh, because someone will be inspire, inspired by your experience, especially when they see you continually triumph over adversary. They themselves don't think that they can do that because of what they're facing, not knowing they're facing the exact same thing that you face. So transparency is very important. This particular topic for me was very important to get on camera because it's a topic that goes um, without attention in the scientific community, in the medical community. For instance, there's a woman at Mount Sinai Hospital in the Bronx, uh, and her name is Rachel Yehuda. She spearheads a department that deals with looking at intergenerational trauma. Mm. Um, what they're looking at specifically is something called um, epigenetics. Epi means above or on top, and genetics refers to the complex system of, of genes and DNA. So epigenetics, as her study is revealing, is basically the, the careful research and study of any changes in the um, gene, but not necessarily a change that will alter the structure of the DNA itself or the DNA sequence. Any changes in the gene itself but not necessarily a change that will interrupt the DNA sequence is something that they've coined as being a epigenetic um, syndrome. Now, what they found in their study, they looked at Holocaust victims. And this, what makes this so important is that when you look at Charlemagne the God's um, social media, for those that follow Charlemagne the God, Charlemagne the God has a video where he's talking about anxiety and how he had to overcome it. In fact, the video was based in part on the book that he just recently wrote that he released October 23rd that I bought and I finished that book within two days. Shout out to Charlemagne, excellent book. Um, number one, he addressed for the very first time his bouts with anxiety and how it has affected him. And there's some terminology that I'm gonna throw out a little later in this dialogue that he used to kind of help people who are going through it cope through it and to kind of bring more awareness and understanding uh, with these terminologies to those who have never encountered them. But nonetheless, uh, Rachel Yehuda's work is examining Holocaust survivors, children who are born to individuals who survived the Holocaust mm -hmm. in Germany, who biologic, whose, whose biological systems, their biochemistry is responding 
to acts they never experienced. In other words, her study is showing that you can have generations that go through trauma, and these generations will birth children who never witnessed or experienced those traumas, yet those traumas become markers on their actual DNA, mm. where it's now called epigenetics. The epigenetic marker sits on top of the DNA and tells the cell how to read or interpret the DNA. And what it does is it will teach, because when we're interpreting, we're teaching, or when we're instructing, we're teaching, it will teach the cell itself how to orchestrate the gene reaction to the environment. So in other words, your parents or generations of your ancestors that are going through traumatic situations, you as the offspring of them who may have never gone through it, never lived through it, wasn't even alive during it, you are now carrying a genetic marker in your DNA from their experience that is causing you to act out negatively. These markers present themselves in the, um, in the arena of anxiety, uh, mental uh, syndromes, mental disorders, and it becomes aggression, it becomes worrisome, it becomes fear, and literally drives some people to the point of near insanity. Wow. This is something that has affected generations of Holocaust survivors, but it's something that was never brought to the attention of the medical community to ever think to look at the African diaspora, the African Holocaust that took place in this country called America, which the Holocaust lasted um, for a much shorter time. In fact, the Holocaust didn't even last a decade. The transatlantic slave trade is at least 100 to 200 years of forced capture and enslavement of African people. And the trauma associated with that are now showing up as markers in the DNA of said people. Because if intergenerational trauma is now seen as genetic markers in European survivors of the Holocaust, their offspring, then certainly African Americans have those same markers. The scientific community is just not interested in coming out and doing those studies and doing those findings. But the fact that they can draw that link and they can say that intergenerational trauma, trauma that is not necessarily experienced by any one person living now, but nonetheless, they're still being affected by trauma that took place almost 100 years ago. Very real. So what's important today for this dialogue is that this is something that is almost uncontrollable in our community. I had made that post that you read just now on Facebook just two days ago, right? And since then, about 85% of the people who responded to that post on Facebook all responded saying they're battling it right now as we speak, anxiety. But I want to tell you something that you don't know. More than 85% of the people who actually openly commented, there were actually more people that came in my inbox to express that they're going through the same thing because the reality is a lot of people don't like to speak about the situation. Openly discuss openly something discuss like it. that yeah. because it's something that's sensitive to everyone. Right. Um, and that... Um, what are some of the triggers okay. for, for an anxiety attack, I believe it's called? What are some of the triggers? What are some of maybe some of your triggers or what will trigger someone's anxiety? Okay, so I'll give you some of my personal experiences. Then I'll give you some of the textbook definitions for some of the triggers. Uh, from my experience, um, there's times that I'll be in shopping warehouses such as, let's say, a Costco or a BJ's, which is an immensely big warehouse. A lot of open space it usually tends to be overcrowded. I cannot stand to be in overcrowded places and spaces because I get the feeling literally of fainting or passing out. I get very, very dizzy. Um, in 2007, 
I was working in New Jersey as an EMT. Um, for those who know, I was an EMT almost 10 years. And I had a patient on the ambulance, and I passed out. Wow. And shout out to my partner, wow. Juan, who uh, was working with me uh, in Jersey, who I believe now is in the fire department EMS in New York City. Um, he actually drove me back to um, the, uh, the office where, you know, I sat down and I was okay. And he also gave me a ride home. On the way home, I fainted again. Wow. He gave me a ride straight to the hospital at that point because something is clearly wrong. When I get to the hospital, they run a series of tests. Um, number one, my BP blood pressure was skyrocketed. My resting rate was like 150 something. You know, that would be your um, systolic or diastolic. And you know, the problem with that is that your resting rate should always be under 100, always. You know, 120 over 80 is the ideal blood pressure, they say, right? So anything over that, um, there's factors in place that, such as your age, such as your gender. Women usually have a lower blood pressure than men. Um, also, some of your um, eating habits. But nonetheless, when I came in with a resting rate of 150, they knew it was a problem. They hooked me up to the EKG, and they said, everything is fine. I went home. I was worrying a lot because what I felt was very real. I fainted twice. I fainted with a patient on my ambulance during a 911 call. But that could luckily, cost you your job. That could have cost me my job. But luckily, it was a call that it wasn't that much of a trauma that was so serious that it had to be addressed immediately. Um, we had a patient on the bus that, um, and when I say bus, I mean ambulance, that's EMT talk. We had a patient on the bus that literally, I believe, uh, was playing soccer and cut their leg. So it was a, you know, it was a band, you know, they go into the hospital to get stitches. So um, it wasn't a patient that their life could have been in danger because of my situation. But in, in hindsight, me looking back, what if that was one of the patients that I had on my bus, of which I've had in times previous, that had a gunshot wound? Or a patient that couldn't breathe? You know, a patient that, as we say, was coding? You know I mean? They're about to leave up out of here. So it was at that point that I actually had to sit back and kind of reassess whether or not I was going to be an EMT. And uh, slowly but surely, I actually left. And part of my decision to leave uh, working as an EMT were those episodes that I had where I fainted on a job. Mm -hmm. uh, I said to myself that it's not, um, it's not right to continue in this field of which I loved. I loved working as an EMT paramedic, but I couldn't continue with it knowing that I had a condition that would put others in harm's way. Jeopardize other people's that would lives. Jeopardize other people's safety. So I made a decision to leave. In fact, you know, I still, just so people know, um, I still walk around with my EMT badge, <laughs> with my six-digit EMS numbers. For those that know, put it up a little bit higher. For those so that know, EMTs, camera. you know, were issued a six-digit uh, New York State number. Right. You know, I still walk around with it because of the perks that I get from it. <laughs> but I'm sure there's somebody out there that's going to say Zion Lex an agent. So let me hold it up real quick so you can see that. All right. so, agent si Zion Lex. Agent Lex. <laughs> so, um, what are some of the the um? Are there any treatment options for anxiety disorder? That's a very, very good um, question. There's definitely treatment options. The number one treatment option that I would opt for individuals to, to, to take is therapy. The ability to sit down with someone who's very knowledgeable in this particular field of dealing with anxiety disorders or anxiety syndromes and being able simply to talk about it. Now. In more extreme cases, um, the medical community does recommend medicating individuals. But because I have a personal problem with the way medication is administered in this country for various ailments, I would opt not to do that. Um, there are certain herbs that you can take that may help you. Any, nerve, any herb that is noted to calm the nervous system or, you know, which basically calms the entire body and the mind is an, is an herb that will work for you if you're going through anxiety. Um, something as light as chamomile tea, very calming. There's been times that I've had episodes and attacks. I went and I made me some chamomile tea, put a little bit of honey, a teaspoon of honey, 
Within two to three minutes, I'm fine like it never happened before. But versus me taking medication that would have had side effects. Now, we all familiar with um, medication in this country. When they run the commercial, it's about a 60 second commercial, right? Right. And about 20 seconds of the commercial is all the good things. Right. And the last 40 seconds is all the ways that this medication is going to kill you. Go harm you, right. So I, I don't play with their medication. Right, right. Right, yeah. So, um, are there any, any underlying medical problems that could be causing it? Absolutely. There are some um, medical factors that contribute to it, um, but for the most part, anxiety is a disorder of the mind. And as they'll tell you in a hospital setting, it's a mental um, disorder, it's a mental condition. It's not really anything physical. Now, if you have an individual who has a brain disease where the brain may be literally be deteriorating, then yeah, you may see signs of, or symptoms of anxiety, Right. you know? Um, but for the most part, there's no actual physical condition you know, that is linked to anxiety. It's mostly a, a mental thing, okay. which is why it's one of the hardest things to treat. Because as an EMT, I could tell you that I've bandaged and applied dressing to people that had gunshot wounds, to people that had stab wounds. I've put my non-rebreather, I've put the nasal cannula under people's noses. You know, I've done my CPR, but what bandage and what dressing are you going to apply to someone who has psychological trauma? Mm. It's so easy to grab the AED and shock somebody back to life, right? Well, what happens when that trauma is psychological? How do you address that? How do we switch from that physical modality where we physically know what to do when something is physically going wrong to how do we deal with something that is totally mental? Right. You know, most people say that's between you and your God at that point. Right. Because there's not, there's not much that any one man can do for you. This right. is taking place in your mind. Right. And a lot of the things that trigger, or some of the things that trigger anxiety is overthinking. overthinking. So individuals who work at jobs where there's a high demand um, for them to um, respond in, into various situations, you know, people who type all day, um, people who are public speakers, uh, people who are educators, public educators, these are people that have a lot of signs and symptoms of, of anxiety. And these are people who are constantly draining the mind day by day. And your mind only can take but so much stress before it begins to send signals throughout the body that will change your environment based on your response. So here is what I came to express and speak about today. I came to talk about the fact that when we talk about anxiety in our community as Africans, as black people, one of the main things that is never addressed are the causes. And one of the reasons why one of the main things that, are, that is never addressed, such as the cause, is because even in the field of science and medicine, they still really can't pinpoint the cause, you know, which is why a lot of times it's called a, an anxiety syndrome. You know, it has several different ways of manifesting itself, but they still even haven't found a cause. You know, a lot of things that fall under the blanket of being termed a syndrome are things that have so many ways of manifesting itself on the surface, but insidiously, they cannot find the cause. Anxiety falls under that. But due to the new research brought by individuals such as uh, Rachel Yehuda over at Mount Sinai Hospital, we now know, science is now proving that trauma can follow you intergenerationally. Mm, genetically. Genetically. Okay. So my ancestors who experienced the trauma of the transatlantic slave trade, they now show up on my DNA marker, literally. You can actually look at it. I believe it's called the FPK95 genome that they actually attach themselves to, hence why they call it the epi 
genome or the epigenetic. Or the and epigen this is found in everyone, anyone, everyone that was studied to have had anxiety. This particular marker is found on their on their genes on their right. genome. So this particular marker has been found in um, those who they tested it on, which happens to be uh, European Jews of the Holocaust experience, right? Okay. So. What they did was... Which they, naturally with them, they would have it because they, they ancestors went through ancestors trauma and absolutely shock. absolutely went right. through a lot of trauma and, and, and shock right. due to, um, you know, what the atrocities that they faced in Europe. Right. Now, my thing is this. The Holocaust in Europe did not last anywhere close to 10 years. Now... The African Holocaust mm -hmm. is no less than 200 years right. of Correct. Europeans going into Africa, taking Africans, bringing them around the waters, and coming through what they call the Channel of the Middle Passage and dropping us at various drop-off points, right? Right. And then even when we got to these points, we're still facing trauma, right? And here's the thing about the resilience of black people or African people. For now, almost 400 years, we've gone through trauma living in this diaspora within America as well as the Caribbean. And for these 400 years, we've gone without therapy. Do you know that in a hospital setting, when an individual is going through a traumatic um, experience, the first thing recommended is therapy because without therapy, it will only become worse. worse. And it is known that not only will it begin to affect the life of the individual that is going through it, but the lives of anyone connected to that individual. And again, now science is showing that the individual's children will begin to go through those It'll things. But the beautiful thing about it all, to look at things from a positive perspective, is that even though therapy has gone unaddressed in the African community, in the African diaspora for now 400 years, look at the resilience of black African people in this country. It has not broken our spirit. Even through all of these traumas that we face and the way that it shows up as anxiety, we're still celebrating. That's right. We're still smiling. That's right. We're still making history. We're still inventing, we are still creating, we are still excelling. Not to the degree or level that we would like to, but certainly not to the expectation that those who placed us here 400 years ago would have ever looked and thought we would have become. We have black billionaires in this country. We have black people that literally passed every single test known to man when it comes to assessing the IQ. And these are individuals that are doing these things, even going through trauma and living in a traumatic environment and excelling even through anxiety. So what I wanted to point out is the fact that anxiety is a silent killer because it also causes the heart to race. Um, let's say you're driving, which as, we exp I, as I explained to you earlier, most people who have anxiety attacks will usually tell you that they have anxiety attacks when they're driving. 